Okay, hello everyone. Thanks for joining us. My name is Robert. I'll be your host. This is the Rosa Parks before, during, and after the bus boycott 65th anniversary live stream program slash presentation. So it was 65 years ago tonight on December 1st, 1955 that Rosa Parks was arrested, an event that had a huge impact on the civil rights movement, American history, world history, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. So we're going to go ahead and talk about that. Now, if you are interested, feel free to welcome and introduce yourselves. You can tell us your first name, where you're connecting from, and anything else you'd like to add in the Q&A section. Usually the Q&A section is down at the bottom of everyone's screen. And if you haven't used Zoom before, there's a lot of different things that you can customize. We don't have time, unfortunately, to do a Zoom demonstration because we only have a limited amount of time together this evening. But usually the two things that people want to adjust the most are the sound level, either up or down. And you can do that locally on your device. And sometimes people want to adjust the screen display, meaning they want the slides that are being shown to take up the full screen. If you want to do that, if you see boxes that have my name on it, Robert Kellerman, you can either minimize those, you can hit the X button and X them out, you can drag them down to the bottom of the screen, or you can look for something called view options and then click the side by side mode on or off. If you have any technical problems tonight, feel free to let us know in the Q&A section. And every once in a while, the Zoom site will kind of um, get in a degraded mode. If that happens, what will we'll get disconnected. Um, if you do get disconnected for any reason, just feel free to reconnect and we'll start back up again. That usually doesn't happen very often, but every once in a while it does. So just FYI on that. And we're also broadcasting this program to all of our friends on Facebook Live, and we're going to make a recording for our YouTube page. So if you have to leave us early, you can join us and later and catch up what you missed. For those of you not familiar with us, we're Washington, D.C. History and Culture. We're a nonprofit community organization. And we are going to be talking tonight about Rosa Parks, the first lady of civil rights. She was born in 1913 and passed away in 2005, had a long, illustrious life. Now, a few things that we're going to be discussing is we're going to be talking about the site down in Montgomery, Alabama, where the bus boycott uh, kicked off when Rosa was arrested. This is the historical marker in downtown Montgomery. Here's another view of it. I won't stop to read that because I'll basically tell you everything that's on the plaque and then some just to point out that it's actually there. Not sure if any of you have been to Montgomery, but if you get a chance, definitely worthwhile. Uh, there's a lot of civil rights sites in Alabama and particularly in Montgomery, including this nice statue of Rosa Parks herself. And the spot where the arrest took place there's a Rosa Parks Museum. It's part of Troy University. And this is another site that you can go uh, take a look at when you're visiting. Of course, you probably want to wait for the COVID situation to get more under control. But again, this is in Montgomery, Alabama. And they have a lot of exhibits about all different types of things, um, civil rights and et cetera, et cetera. And it's really highly rated on TripAdvisor. So if you're ever visiting somewhere, you should go to TripAdvisor and check out the different tourist type sites and see what people have to say. And this one is highly rated. Now, the main kind of part of our program tonight, though, is there's an exhibit at the Library of Congress called Rosa Parks in her own words. Now, you can't see it now because the Library of Congress is not open to public because of the COVID situation. But this exhibit kicked off in December of last year, and it's really well done. It's a lot of Rosa Parks historical and contextual information about her life kind of before, during, and after the bus boycott. And the in her own words part was Rosa spent a lot of time during her life um, making notes and writing letters and things like that. And so the exhibit has a lot of documentary type evidence to kind of help tell the story about Rosa Parks unique life. And so part of our presentation tonight is going to be going through some of the things that you could see if you were actually able to visit the Library of Congress in person. So you can kind of consider this like a, a virtual or online uh, visit to the exhibit with kind of some extra stuff added in along the way. This is a photograph of the exhibit entrance. And I've lived in Washington, D.C. Uh, 
well, I've lived in Washington, D.C. previously, but in this current stint, I've lived here about six years, and this is one of my favorite exhibits they've had in Washington, D.C. There's a lot of exhibits in D.C. every year, um, but this one has been one of my all-time favorites. It's just really well done. And so again, a lot of the content this evening for this presentation is going to be going through this exhibit um, if you were able to do so in person. Now you might be wondering, why is a white guy uh, giving a presentation about Rosa Parks? Well, that's a good question. Um, <laughs> a few different answers. Uh, number one, I really like history and I've always been fascinated with Rosa Parks. She's a very interesting individual. And after the bus boycott, Rosa Parks had to flee Montgomery, Alabama for her safety. And she moved to Detroit, which is where I'm originally from. So. Rosa Parks and I were both Detroiters um, at different point in times in our lives. And then also too, I really like this exhibit a lot at the Library of Congress, but I was surprised that when it first opened, they weren't giving guided tours of it. It was basically just something that you would just show up and walk around on your own um, and then leave. There was no, initially, there was no kind of formal tours in place because I inquired about that. Um, I wanted to take our history group down and have someone show them around. So they didn't initially have the tours set up. And so I thought, you know what? Um, I know quite a bit about Rosa Parks myself. I'll just go ahead and give the tour myself. Um, so that's what I did. I invited our group down. I think we had the tours four or five times in early 2020 before the COVID thing took place um, and people got a lot of great feedback. So kind of in the spirit of be the change you want to see, um, since there was no one that I knew of giving a tour of the Rosa Parks exhibit, I thought, you know what, I'll just go do it myself. And we thought at some point in time we would start doing those in-person tours again, but those are all on hold. Thus this live stream presentation. So that's kind of the story about why I'm giving you the Rosa Parks presentation but more about that a little bit later. Now there's three famous photos of Rosa Parks. This is one of them. This is another one. And this is the third one. And I really like the history of photography and how um, photojournalism and photography documents things that take place historically speaking. But there's a few misconceptions about these photos. Um, and so I'm gonna talk about that as well. I oftentimes see these um, like on internet sites and they're not uh, describing accurately what's being depicted in the photo, and we'll talk why that is a little bit later, so you can be on the lookout for that. Um, but let's talk about Rosa Parks' life before the bus boycott, and a big part of this presentation, similar to when we were doing our tours at the Library of Congress, was I was really hoping that people would get more of an appreciation of Rosa's life, the things that she did before the bus boycott. And then I feel like most people are familiar with, oh yeah, Rosa Parks, she got arrested, the bus boycott, civil rights, yeah. yeah. Um, but they maybe don't know a lot of the details about what the bus boycott was all about. And in particular, Rosa Parks' uh, arrest and then her involvement in it. And then also too, after the bus boycott was ended, Rosa had a fascinating life. And I also feel like that part of her story um, is really not that well known. And so as we go through this presentation tonight, we'll kind of fill in some of those knowledge gaps, so to speak. Um, if you had to describe Rosa's early life um, from the time she was born in 1913 to 1955, um, and I'm basing this on reading her autobiography, which we'll talk more about a little bit later, she was constantly living in an environment of racism, discrimination, segregation, and violence. And I'm sure most people probably already know that or understand that. What was really um, shocking to me was how prevalent it was, like constantly, time after time after time after again, um, just one thing after another was just really um, shocking. So no surprise that she would have grown up in that kind of environment. What you might not be um, is appreciative of is how severe all of these things were, the racism, discrimination, segregation, and violence. So let's talk about some of these things. So this is pictures of the Library of Congress exhibit. Now these photos that I'm showing you are from the Library of Congress. There are pictures I took myself. A friend of mine's a serious photographer. He took some of these pictures. Some of them are on the public domain that I got. So they're kind of from all over the place. The ones that are really crystal clear um, are either from the Library of Congress or my friend, the photographer. The ones that are blurry and out of focus, um, those are the ones that I took, just FYI. But anyway, this is the kind of first part of the exhibit talks about Rose's background, her ancestry, and they have the family Bible here on the bottom left corner of the screen. And Rose's ancestors have been recorded in there. 
So because this is a Library of Congress exhibit, they have a lot of documentary type evidence, more so than if you went to an exhibit at say an art museum or a history, regular history museum or something like that. And so this is one example of like a document that they have on file. This is Rosa's family tree. Um, the font on this is a little bit small. So if you're screen, if you're looking at this on a phone or something, um, apologies for that. Uh, I'll just read it off to you. I won't go through her whole family tree, but her father's name was James. He was born in 1886. And her mother's name was Leona, born in 1887. And again, Rosa herself born on February 4th, 1913. This is pictures of her parents. That's her father on the left. He was a carpenter slash home builder. He was very handy with his hands. Um, he was very talented. He built a lot of homes and did finishings and whatnot um, with different architectural structures. And then this is a picture of her mom. Her mom is the one who's seated in the photo and Rosa Parks' mom was a school teacher and really instilled in her at a very early age the importance of getting an education. This is the house that Rosa Parks was born in, in Tuskegee, Alabama. Um, we'll talk about where Tuskegee is in just a little bit, but a pretty, um, pretty basic house of the day. And if you're not familiar geographically with Alabama, we're going to be talking about different names of places within Alabama. And just to give you kind of a real quick overview, Rose is born in Tuscaloosa, which is where the black dot with the number one next to it is. Um, she spends a good portion of her time in Alabama, either in Montgomery or in uh, cities that are kind of in close proximity to Montgomery. And then also a uh, Rosa spends some time in southeastern Alabama. So we'll talk about that. So as we're going through and mentioning these different names places, that's just to give you a geographical reference. This is the historical marker that's outside the home where Rosa Park spent most of her kind of childhood. Her parents end up splitting up and her mom moves back home with her parents. Um, and so Rosa spends a lot of time living um, on the estate or on the property of her grandparents, her maternal grandparents. Um, now, this is a photo from a couple years ago, and I was doing research to try and find out what the status of her kind of childhood home is, and I didn't see any updates. And so maybe if someone is in Alabama or knows um, what the status of this house is, you can type that in the Q&A and let me know. But I, I've not seen any updates on anything happening to this house. And the most recent pictures that I saw of it, um, it was in this kind of condition. So kind of surprising that this house that Rosa spent most of her childhood in um, would be suffering from neglect and wouldn't have been fixed up. But if you have any additional information, feel free to let me know, let us know in the Q&A, and I'll be happy to pass that along. But this home was, is outside of Montgomery, Alabama. Now, of course, during Rosa Parks' uh, lifetime, particularly early on, there's a lot of segregation and uh, discrimination. These aren't necessarily Rosa Parks type photos, uh, or necessarily photos of Rosa Parks, but just to give you kind of a context of what was going on at this point in time um, in America, in particular in Alabama. Um, this, if you're familiar with the civil rights movement, these kind of pictures are probably going to be things you're familiar with, but these presentations, we always get a lot of people that are connecting from outside the United States, and we also frequently get um, children and homeschool groups and things like that. So I don't want to just assume that everyone is familiar with kind of the basics of the civil rights um, situation in the United States before the bus boycott, because that's typically not the case. These particular photos were taken by the famous photographer Gordon Parks. These, um, this one and this one, if you're familiar with Gordon Parks, well-known photographer, he took these pictures. So just uh, the segregation and the Jim Crow kind of structure, so to speak, just very commonplace. And in Rose's autobiography, she just kind of talks about this over and over again of all these different problems that she faced and all these challenges that she had to overcome uh, more so than a uh, non-person of color would have to do in their childhood. This is a well-known photo of a lynching, which is a horrific photo when you see that there's two people um, hanging here. Um, and then, but look at some of the expressions on the people, like this was like a, a social occasion and lynching, unfortunately, was a significant problem. And Rosa was imp intimately familiar with the risk that uh, people of color were subject to in terms of lynching, and particularly um, 
bothered by the expression of the um, people on the left, the couple on the left, they just look like, you know, they're going out on a Saturday night to have a good time. So just really shocking. But I'm showing you these pictures, again, just to make sure everyone understands kind of the environment, because I think um, while everyone might realize that Rosa was arrested for uh, not complying with the segregation laws of the bus, you might not fully appreciate kind of the risk that she was putting herself in. I mean, she's in this environment where all these things are happening, and I want to make sure people are fully aware of that. Um, now, this is a um, historical site that opened up um, a couple years ago. It's called the National Memorial for Peace and Justice, and it's in Montgomery, Alabama, which uh, is right in Rosa Parks' backyard. This has got a lot of great reviews recently. It has exhibits about slavery. This is a um, really well-known sculpture that they have on display. And when you see this, it's, it's just really horrific. It's very moving um, to walk by and look at this. I happened to visit this site myself about um, a year and a half ago. They also have um, information on the police brutality situation. But the most kind of well-known part is this lynching memorial, it's called, um, and it basically has identified all known lynching victims in the United States, of which there are many, and it's just moving to go around. They have them broken out by counties within states, and um, just very shocking to see the number of people that have been lynched over the years. And again, this is in Montgomery, um, Alabama. And so the lynching memorial is in a city that Rosa spent uh, most of her um, young life in. So the very close connection. It's not like this is 500 miles away from where she grew up at. No, it's like right there. This is a lynching that took place in southeastern Alabama. Remember the map that I showed you that had the... Um, the one dot down at the bottom. Um, this is where Rosa, some of her family was from. And so she spent a lot of time in Henry County um, and she would have been, she was familiar with this case. So in February, 1937, Wes Johnson, 18 year old African-American man was accused of attacking a white woman and was arrested. He was abducted from Henry County jail by a mob of 100 white men and lynched, shot and hanged to death. His body was found bullet marked and swinging from a tree as was typical of lynchings, none of the members of the mob was charged with a crime. I'll let you read the rest of that while I tweak something on my computer. Hold on just one second. So again, I'm showing you this just to give you um, the understanding that Rosa would have been very familiar with the risks that would have faced people that quote unquote, you know, got out of line, so to speak, or bucked the system or did not um, do what the white power structure wanted them to do. And then notice too, down towards the bottom, um, it talks about this particular incident is um, recognized at the National Memorial for Peace and Justice in Montgomery, which we just talked about a minute ago. And again, if you wanna visit this site, either in person or online, this is the name of it. It's the National Memorial for Peace and Justice, a very moving place to visit. Um, so again, they have a lot of documentary evidence or information as far as Rose's life. She spent a lot of time writing letters and making notes and transcribing different things. So they have those on display. So it's kind of neat to go through the Library of Congress and see all those. This is a story that Rosa wrote down and talked about later in life that really impacted her. She uh, says, one day when I was about 10, I met a little white boy named Franklin on the road. He was about my size, maybe a little bit larger. He said something to me and he threatened to hit me, balled his fist up as if to give me a sock. I picked up a brick and dared him to hit me. He thought better of the idea and went away. And so this is a really early defining moment in Rosa Parks' life, kind of this questioning um, authority of this, this boy uh, picking on her for her race. And she was, uh, this was a big event in Rosa's life because she went home and told her family what happened. And basically her mom and her grandparents scolded her and told her, you know, what are you doing? You don't ever talk to a white person like that. Um, you know, you need to understand how things work and da, da, da. you could be, end up, you know, in serious trouble and da, 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 da. So she was really hurt by that. Initially, she was kind of proud that she stood up for herself. But when she got home and the family members um, chastised her for, you know, saying these things to this white boy, she was really upset by that. So it was a really defining moment in Rosa Parks' early life. This is a picture of Rosa Parks as a young lady. 
a lot of the pictures that they have uh, the Library of Congress exhibit are the real photos. So this one on the left is the actual real photo that Rosa Parks owned. And then what they do is their uh, photography team kind of um, cleans them up and gives you the kind of the version on the right. This is a uh, description of an event that Rosa wrote about. Um, let me back up for a minute. So what happened was, um, again, there's this constant facing of racism, discrimination, segregation, threats of violence, et cetera, et cetera. And Rosa Parks didn't talk about this particular event um, that I'm going to describe next until much later in her life. But what happened was she was um, hired to house sit um, for a couple and they went out for the evening and she was basically there to, you know, keep an eye on their house. And while she's there, um, a neighbor shows up, a, a white man, and he was drunk and he was uh, making suggestive comments toward her. And she actually thought that she was going to get sexually assaulted uh, by this guy. But eventually she was able to get out of that situation. Um, but it really kind of shocked her, the fact that she had almost been, become a victim of this sexual violence um, that was not all that uncommon in the Jim Crow South, but fortunately she was able to get away. So this shook her up to the extent that she did not talk about this event until much, much later in life, but she did describe it nonetheless. Um, this is her husband uh, the, with the love of her life. His name was Parks. And he was very active in the civil rights movement himself. And Rosa really admired that. She really liked the fact that he was um, involved in trying to make change happen. Um, and he got involved in a case called the Scottsboro Boys. If um, you're not familiar with civil rights history, uh, I really recommend learning about this case. It's a fascinating story. And he was involved, her husband was a barber, and he was involved in raising money for their legal defense. These um, gentlemen were wrongly accused of raping two white women. Um, and it was just a big sham trial. Um, and Rosa's husband was involved in raising money uh, and trying to get these guys free um, and putting really his life in jeopardy because, again, there's risks for um, kind of confronting the system, so to speak. But Rosa really did uh, look up to him and admire his efforts. Now, eventually, she goes to work at the NAACP on a volunteer basis. So um, sometimes you'll hear stories about Rosa Parks say, well, she, you know, she worked at the NAACP, which is kind of sort of true. She wasn't an actual um, paid employee, but she did spend a significant amount of time there. She was volunteering there uh, many, many hours a week, uh, month after month, year after year. So she was very familiar with the NAACP um, processes and organizational structure, um, and et cetera, et cetera, and, and spent a huge investment in time um, getting involved in them and trying to bring about change. This is a NAACP dinner that Rose is at. And again, these are the kind of things that you can go see when you go visit the Library of Congress when they open back up, or you can also visit an online version of this um, program. So it's hard to see Rosa, but if you look on the left side of the table, her husband is the person who's the third down from the end of the table. And then you can just barely see Rosa um, peeking out from behind him. So um, interesting photo there. But they have a lot of these types of things, the Library of Congress. So it's neat to go look at these historical photos. This is E.D. Nixon. He was the head of the local chapter of the NAACP in Montgomery, and he's uh, who Rosa works for, um, and he's a great influence on her as well, kind of like mentoring her um, and kind of getting her more familiar with all the different types of NAACP things that they were involved with. This is a case that was not all that well known until the last few years. So there was a woman named Reese Taylor, um, and she was an, I'll read it to you, she was an African American woman from Abbeville in Henry County. Alabama, that's the spot on the map in Southeast Alabama I was showing you before. She was born and raised in a sharecropping family in the Jim Crow era Southern United States. Taylor's refusal to remain silent about a brutal rape she suffered perpetrated by white men led to organizing an African-American community on behalf of justice and civil rights. On September 3rd, 1944, Taylor was kidnapped while leaving church and gang raped by six white men, despite the men's confessions to authorities two grand juries subsequently decided, declined to indict the men. 
No charges were ever brought against her assailants. The reason why this is an important case is because Rosa Parks gets involved in this case, the NAACP at this point in time, one of their um, initiatives that they were actively involved in was the uh, problem of sexual violence, either white men um, sexually assaulting or raping black women or black men being wrongly accused of sexually assaulting uh, white women. And so they get involved in a lot of these cases and Rosa Parks is sent down here to see what she can do about this case because she's familiar with this part of Alabama at this, at this point in time when she's with the NAA, let me back up a minute. At this point in time when she's with the NAACP, she's in Montgomery. Um, this rape case takes place in southeast Alabama, and Edie Nixon knows that Rosa's from or has family members there and is familiar with the area, so he sends her down to see if she can get involved and get some kind of justice. Unfortunately, there was no justice ever served um, in this case, even though there was some admission of guilt um, on behalf of the rapist. There were no uh, grand jury charges ever brought and the case was pretty much just um, left to go by the wayside. So just a really shocking case. But for the longest time, um, this one wasn't really uh, well known. It was kind of well known within the civil rights history kind of uh, area, so to speak, but maybe not a like a household name type of case. Um, but it was very important. Um, and then over time, though, in the last few years, it's gotten a lot more notoriety, and particularly the fact that Rosa Parks was involved in trying to get the justice here. So there's a really good book out on not only this case, but several others that if you get a chance, you should check out. It's called At the Dark End of the Street. So that's a good one. And then there was a um, film that was made, a documentary film um, called The Rape of Reese Taylor that you can find on the internet. So I really recommend both of these to learn more about this topic. And then uh, Oprah, uh, several years ago, heard about this case. And she basically, I'm paraphrasing, but her basically what she said was, how am I just finding out about this now? This should be like something that everyone in America um, should know about. You know, Oprah knows a lot of stuff and meets a lot of people and is very familiar with a lot of stuff. And she was just really personally shocked that she had only heard of this case a few years ago. And so she started to raise awareness of it and has been talking about it a lot. Um, so it's just, you know, for the longest time, I think the locals uh, kind of authorities and whatnot just wanted to sweep it under the rug and forget about it. But um, it has continued on. So uh, that's kind of just to give you a flavor for some of the things that Rosa was involved when on um, the night of, when, by the time the night of December 1st, 1955 rolls around. So again, there's this constant threat of violence um, towards African-Americans. There's all this segregation and racism and Jim Crow stuff. And she's also very involved doing all she can um, in her activities with the NAACP. And again, it was 65 years ago tonight that Rosa Parks was arrested in Montgomery, Alabama. Hold on for one second while I tweak something on my computer. Okay, so let's talk about Rosa Parks' arrest. I'm sure most people are just familiar with the basics of the story. This is the portion of the exhibit that goes into that, but let's go into more detail and talk about kind of all the different things that happened because it's a really fascinating event, not only for what ended up coming out of it, but just actually the event itself. Now, Rosa, what, what did she do for a living? What was her job or her profession? She was a seamstress. And so at the Library of Congress exhibit, they have articles of clothing um, that she made, including this one here. So if you look at the blue arrow, they have that on display. So she was a seamstress. And then uh, not too far away from the Library of Congress is the Smithsonian National Museum of African American History and Culture, another place that everyone should visit. And they have also a dress that Rosa Parks made. So again, she was a seamstress. You can go check that out. It's on display. Here's a closer up view of it. And this is the department store that Rosa worked for. So basically what she would do is um, repair clothes and make alterations and, you know, do all the different things that would be required of a seamstress. And so she, that's what she was doing um, on the night that she was arrested. And so she goes into work, um, does her job and gets off work and is going to take the bus home when um, things start uh, progressing from there, so to speak. 
And again, this, so this department store is no longer there. This is back in the day, if you're old enough to remember when they had the downtown department store type shopping setups, that's what Montgomery Fair was. I guess to use, um, like if you're from Detroit, um, it would be gonna be similar to Hudson's or if you're in Washington DC, it'd be familiar, it'd be to, uh, similar to Woody's. This is a bus similar to the one that Rosa was arrested on. And there's a little bit of um, misunderstanding about what actually happened when Rosa was arrested. And so I thought there's a lot of different stuff on the internet. And I really like this diagram. I think the Detroit News put this together, the Detroit newspaper, if I'm not mistaken, if it was someone else, um, my, my apologies. But um, let's go through the progression. It says, number one, Rosa Parks boarded the bus and sat at an aisle seat in the designated what was known as the colored section. Again, she got off work. It was on December 1st. She works at a department store and she's gonna take the bus home. Um, number two, three stops later, the driver told Parks and three other blacks in her row to move to the back to make room for a white man. So this particular section where Rosa was sitting, um, it was a section of the bus that was subject to change. If there were not very many white people sitting, if there were not many white people on the bus, African Americans could sit there. However, if more whites came on the bus, those people were supposed to move further back. Um, and so that's what does not happen for Rosa. Um, and then it says point number three, the three blacks moved to the back. Park slid to an adjacent seat, slid to an adjacent window seat and refused to move. So you can see she's where the she was initially sitting where the number one is. And then she moved to the where the number two is kind of at the bottom of the screen. Um, and then it says number four, Parks was arrested for refusing to give up her seat at the request of the bus driver. And then the red star kind of shows where he was sitting. So the front of the bus would be, of course, on the right of this diagram and the back of the bus would be on the left. So Rosa was always adamant about the fact that she was not sitting in the white section. That's kind of a thing that really bothered her that um, that was part of the legend, so to speak, of Rosa. Parks. She wasn't she wasn't sitting in the white section, but she was sitting in the section that they could convert into a, a white section, supposedly. But she was not fish sitting in the official white section. She was sitting right behind it. But that being said, if as per custom of, and law of the day, if those seats were needed, um, African Americans would have to give those seats up and move further back. And that's what she did not do. She wrote a lot of letters or written accounts of what happened to her. Um, here is Rose's quote uh, exactly of what happened to her. And if you get a chance, if you haven't done so before, really read uh, Rosa Park's book that she wrote. It's a pretty quick read and it's just really fascinating. The part that talks about her arrest is, I don't know, like 5% of the book. It's a pretty small amount, but just a person with a really fascinating life. Uh, myself growing up in Michigan uh, many, many years after, the bus boycott, I just was really struck by the um, Jim Crow racist segregation uh, discrimination type stuff. I mean, I knew that that existed, but to hear it kind of firsthand from someone who experienced it was, um, was very moving. So she says, uh, describing her arrest, she says, I was sitting in the front seat of the colored section of a bus in Montgomery, Alabama. The white people were sitting in the white section. More white people got on and they filled up all the seats in the white section. When that happened, we black people were supposed to give up our seats to the whites, but I didn't move. The white bus driver said, let me have those front seats. I didn't get up. I was tired of giving in to white people. I'm going to have you arrested, the driver said. You may do that, I answered. Two white policemen came. I asked one of them, why do you all push us around? He answered, I don't know, but the law is the law and you're under arrest. And so that's Rose's account. That's actually on the very first page of her um, autobiography. But that's what her um, uh, perspective on the story was. And then here's what the police officer had to say a little bit later on. So here's what his uh, story was. He says, when I got on that bus, she was the only one sitting up front and there were three or four other blacks sitting in the back end of the bus, sitting there not saying anything. They meaning the two other police officers that showed up, offered her a chance to move to the back and she refused. So one of them touched her on the shoulder and said, you're now under arrest in violation of city ordinance for not sitting in the proper place. Parks acted like a lady during that time and she didn't give us no problems. 
I didn't have any prejudice against her. I still don't. So that was one of the three arresting officers. So when Rosa refused to give up her seat, the bus driver got off the bus, went to a payphone, called into the dispatch that there was a person that was not um, you know, cooperating. The three policemen come out and have her arrested. And things progress from there. Uh, this is at the Library of Congress. Again, more documentary type stuff. This is actually the police report that was typed up when Rosa was arrested. That's on the left. And then her fingerprints, gosh, fingerprinted like a common criminal just for um, helping to progress the civil rights movement. So pretty fascinating to be able to look at that. When you when I go to museums, I always like to look and see what people stop and check out. And um, people are always really fascinated by the fingerprint. Puggy kids, um, they really get a kick out of looking at her fingerprint. So it's kind of neat to be able to see those in person. And then what about the bus driver? What did he have to say? Uh, so he said later on in an interview, I wasn't trying to do anything to that parks woman except do my job. She was in violation of the city code. So what was I supposed to do? The damn bus was full and she wouldn't move back. I had my orders. I had police powers. Any driver for the city did. So the bus filled up and a white man got on and she had his seat and I told her to move back and she wouldn't do it. Um, and then later on when he ended up passing away in 2002, uh, Rosa Parks was asked to comment about his death. And she says, quote, I'm sure his family will miss him. And, and that was pretty much all she had to say. Um, now, one thing that's interesting is I've never been able to find the identity of the person who got on the bus and caused the bus driver to instruct or ask or tell, I guess maybe tell would be the best word, tell Rosa uh, to move further back. I've never been able to find out who the name of that person is. I mean, it must have been somebody, but the person after all this happened must have like, you know what, I'm just going to pretend that I was never there. I don't want to be known as the guy who started the Montgomery bus boycott. So um, if you happen to be familiar with who that is, let me know. But I've done a lot of research and I've never seen anybody come forward and say, oh yeah, yeah, that was me. Now there was a woman a white woman who came that was on the bus and she actually met Rosa Parks many, many years later and they kind of had a, a reunion. And I think some people initially doubted her story that she was actually on the bus with Rosa Parks. But then when Rosa met her and started talking to her, um, she basically, like, oh yeah, 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 you were there. That's actually what she said, you were there. So interesting enough. Um, so that who knows who the guy was who got on the bus. He's a name lost to history. Um, and then this is another thing that Rosa was really always bothered by. There was a lot of misconceptions about her and that evening and whatnot. And I think this is the quote that kind of addresses that from her perspectives. And so she says, people always say that I didn't give up my seat because I was tired, but that isn't true. I was not tired physically or no more tired than I usually was at the end of a working day. I was not old. Although some people have an image of me as being old then, I was 42. No, the only tired I was, was tired of giving in. I put in red font that last part because that's, the whole quote is pretty famous, but that last sentence that I put in red, that's probably one of Rosa Parks most famous quotes, but she was always bothered and you know, rightfully so by this kind of thought that, well, she didn't give up her seat because she was this tired old lady and, you know, da, da, da. no, that, that wasn't what the situation was at all. So again, part of the reason why to do a program like this is to make sure kind of people have a good understanding of what actually take place because sometimes with history or not even sometimes, a lot of times with history, um, things kind of get distorted over time and uh, people, you know, have different thoughts and ideas on stuff. But this is right from Rose's uh, lips herself, what she had to say. Now, if you want a pretty good um, synopsis of Rosa Parks' arrest, um, you can check out the Rosa Parks story. So we're actually going to be watching this movie tonight, um, our group, at 8 p.m. Eastern. If you want to join us for that, you're more than welcome to. Uh, you should have the information on how to participate in that in the information that was in uh, this particular program. If you can't join us, um, check the movie out on your own. It's called The Rosa Parks Story with Angela Bassett in the title role. And again, we'll be doing that a little bit later. So let's talk about the Montgomery bus boycott. It began on December 5th, 1955, or four days after Rosa was arrested, and it ended on December 20th, 1956, and it's known as the 381 days that changed the world. 
Now, Rosa was not the first person to be arrested um, for being in violation of the city codes. Claudette Coven was a somewhat famous case now. She was a teenager that got arrested um, several months before Rosa, but um, her case did not um, proceed the way that Rose's did. And you know, some of this stuff I have to kind of skip over. I can't go into a ton of details because we only have so much time together. When you're talking about someone as impactful and fascinating as Rosa Parks, and you only have an hour, a little bit more than an hour, you kind of have to um, skip over some stuff. But if you want to learn more about the civil rights movement, you should read about the Claudette Coven case. Um, now, this is Rosa a little bit later in uh, after her arrest, and that's Martin Luther King in the background. One thing I forgot to mention about Rosa's arrest is she talks about how um, her treatment after she was arrested, like for instance, she went down, they took her, they arrested her, and they took her down to the police station, but they wouldn't let her make a phone call. And the only reason that anyone even knew that she was in jail was because the wife of one of the people that that worked at the NAACP um, recognized her and basically started telling people that, hey, I saw Rosa Parks get arrested um, and taken off the bus. And that's the only way that like her husband and Edie Nixon and other people knew that she had been arrested. It wasn't because she, was, she wasn't allowed to make a phone call. And then she also talks about how you know, she had gotten off work and you know she'd worked all day. And when she gets down to the police station, she was thirsty and she said, can I have a, some water and they said no sorry the the drinking fountain is for whites only and so they wouldn't even give her any water so um, pretty shocking when you read and those are just a few examples of kind of the mistreatment so Martin Luther King he was going to school uh, in up north and he graduates with his doctorate thus the doctor and Dr. Martin Luther King and he has different career opportunities. And one of them is to be a pastor of the Dexter Avenue Baptist Church in Montgomery, Alabama. He's only 26 years old. And so in early 1955, he makes arrangements to move to Montgomery. Uh, Martin Luther King was from Atlanta. And so it's kind of fate that he actually just ends up getting sent down here. Um, and so he arrives in Montgomery a few months before Rosa Parks is arrested and takes over as pastor of the Dexter Avenue Baptist Church, thus having um, a uh, intertwined historical relationship with Rosa Parks. That's why one reason why the two of them are often connected. This is where they first uh, met. And because he's so um, charismatic and for various other reasons, he's put in charge of what's known as the Montgomery Improvement Association, which is basically the response to Rosa's arrest. And King plays a vital role in the leadership of that organization, um, in addition to his religious duties. Um, this is him speaking to church. So um, that's the thought initially is that the bus boycott will just be for one day. And when you read Martin Luther King's accounts of the bus boycott, he talks about he wasn't sure if this was even going to work, if people were going to um, continue riding the bus or not. And he was pleasantly surprised when the first day, hardly anybody was on the bus. And so then it was such a success that they decided to continue the boycott even longer. But Martin Luther King plays a pivotal role in the leadership of the bus boycott number one. Number two, they weren't sure it was going to work. I think maybe now it might be just kind of like a given, like, oh, she got arrested. They did the bus boycott and everything, you know, got um, taken care of. Well, that was, it wasn't quite that easy. There was a lot of things that, um, you know, were involved in the whole entire process. Now, this is where Rosa was living at the time of the Montgomery bus boycott, a place called the Cleveland Court Apartments. You can go, you can go, if you go to Montgomery, you can go by and check it out. Um, there's not really a lot to see except for the building and the sign. I mean, it's, there's someone living there, so it's not like you can go knock on their door and be like, hey, can I come check out Rosa Parks' old apartment? Um, but it would be pretty cool if you were living in Rosa Parks' old house. Um, but it is in Montgomery, Alabama, and here's a map that shows you the distance between her house and her employer. So it's about a mile and a half. And so, yeah, much more convenient if you can take the bus. You probably could walk that if you had to, but you know, after a long day at work, that might be a little bit challenged. And then, you know, what if it's raining or cold or really super hot? Um, so the bus would have been much more convenient. Now, Rosa doesn't have the problem of worrying about how she's gonna get to work after the bus boycott starts, because guess what happens? She gets fired from her job. Yes, that's actually correct. So 
what happened was she's working at the department store as a seamstress. And what's the busiest time of year in retail? The holidays, right before Christmas. And so remember, Rosa got arrested on December 1st. So it's right the beginning of the holiday season. So, but because of the bus boycott and all the publicity that it's getting in Montgomery, she's called into her boss's office and basically told that her services are no longer needed at the department store because they just don't have enough work for her, which she was really shocked by. She's like, what do you mean you don't have enough work for me? This is the busiest time of the year, the month of December. And, but they were adamant that she had to leave. So they didn't fire her for the bus boycott, supposedly. It was because they didn't have enough work for her. So pretty shocking in that regard. Now her husband, oh, and there's the department store again. So it would have called Montgomery Fair. Now her husband, um, he also had employment problem after the bus boycott because he worked at a barber shop that was owned by a white man. And this guy told um, him, his name was Raymond Parks, that because of all the controversy surrounding the bus boycott, that he was not allowed while he was at work to mention either the bus boycott or his wife's name. And Raymond Park says, you know what? <laughs> I don't wanna work anywhere where I'm not allowed to say my wife's name. And he ended up leaving the barbershop. And so Rosa Parks and her husband both lose their jobs because of the bus boycott. So again, I think part of the, um, the unfortunate part of this story is that, you know, oh yeah, Rosa Parks, you know, she was really heroic and, you know, did a great job and stuff and whatnot, but you maybe not realize the number one, the risk that she was putting herself and her husband and other people at because of the, you know, lynchings and sexual assaults and all that stuff. But then also like the, the financial ramifications. I mean, imagine you and your husband are working uh, one day and the next, both of you have lost your jobs. Well, that's exactly what happened to the two of them. Now, people with uh, the bus is not available, they have to come up with all different means of uh, getting about around town, whether it's walking or ride sharing or et cetera, et cetera. Um, Martin Luther King <laughs> talks about um, periodically seeing people ride horses down uh, the streets in downtown Montgomery. Uh, so you pretty much had to do whatever you could do. There was a lot of car sharing. Um, the taxis and cabs got involved that reduced rates so that make them more affordable. Um, churches bought cars to help transport people. So they had kind of this um, network of carpooling options. Now it wasn't like Uber or Lyft or anything like that. It wasn't that advanced, of course. Um, and there were oftentimes delays and you know things happened, but it did help um, get people from point to point some churches raised money or had people donate funds so that they could go buy church, uh, cars to transport people as best they could. Um, there was retaliation though. Uh, a lot of the churches had their car insurance canceled for trying to subvert um, the busing system. Uh, this is the Martin Luther King Civil Rights Museum in Memphis. They have a big exhibit about the bus boycott because of Martin Luther King's involvement. This was an exhibit about kind of the car sharing. You can see this, if your screen is big enough, you can see this car, it says on the top of it, um, Holt Street Baptist Church. So churches were buying cars and trying to help shuttle people from place to place as best they could. But most people just had to walk. Um, that's just the reality of the situation. There was a fair amount of press coverage of this event, but most of it was in kind of African-American uh, newspapers. You do, if you go back and look at the historical records, you do see some press coverage of the Montgomery boy, bus boycott. But I think for the average American now, if you were to go back and look and see how much this event was talked about kind of in mainstream media, at that point in time, back in 1956, you'd probably be shocked by how it was not covered as maybe significantly as you would expect. I mean, it gets a little bit of coverage, but I mean, this is one of, ends up becoming one of like the major events um, in the history of the United States. And it gets a little bit of mainstream press cover, but not a great deal, in my opinion. Let's move forward on that. Now, the, there's a lot of racism and of course there's threats of violence um, against the civil rights movement and so this was Montgomery newspaper 
from January 31st, 1956. So this is about two months after the bus boycott starts. And if you look over on the right side of the paper, you can see blast rocks residents of bus boycott leader. It says none injured after bombing of King home. So the King was Martin Luther King. He had his house firebombed. Um, so using violence to intimidate people. Fortunately, no one was injured. One of many, many times uh, Martin Luther King was on the receiving end of violence, having, having his house firebombed. Um, now, this was the photo that I was mentioning earlier. It's very famous. And this is Rosa Parks being fingerprinted. And sometimes it's unfortunate. I see this photo described as Rosa Parks being fingerprinted after she was arrested um, for not giving up her seat on the bus. That's kind of sort of true, but kind of not really. What actually happened was uh, Rosa was, and Martin Luther King and some other people were indicted in February of 1956, so about two and a half months after she was initially arrested. They were indicted because the local authorities um, were accusing them of illegally boycotting the buses. They were basically trying to throw uh, charges at them to kind of break their, but the, break the boycott. And so she got indicted for participating in the bus boycott. So she goes down to the police station, as does Martin Luther King and several other people. So this is when she's being fingerprinted. And I guess the, um, the, the press was allowed to show up and take the picture of her. Um, so this is what this is. So this is not her being fingerprinted immediately after she was arrested um, on December 1st. This is in February, and the charges were related to her participation in the bus boycott, not for giving up her seat. And there's very um, similar photos of Martin Luther King taken at the same time. So if you've seen pictures of Dr. King, you might have seen this photo. This is on the exact same day as this one. And then the mug shot was also from the same day. So again, I frequently see this photo labeled um, Rosa Parks mug shot after she was arrested for refusing to give up her bus seat. And, it's kind of sort of true in the sense that it was a related charge, the bus boycott charges that they were trying to throw at the um, her and Martin Luther King and the others, but it wasn't actually for when she was arrested on the bus, so just FY. And there's this famous photo of Martin Luther King also taken at the same time. So this photo, this photo, this photo, and this photo, all taken on the same day in February of 1956, about two and a half months after the arrest took place and it was because the local authorities were trying to basically break the boycott, but it didn't work. Uh, and then the, the, the charges go through this legal process and eventually um, Rose is, uh, is able to kind of get out. I mean, she doesn't have to go to jail or anything like that. And these are just pictures of her with different um, civil rights. Figures. That's Edie Nixon uh, there and then you might recognize uh, that gentleman there. So she's again still participating um, in her involvement in the NAACP. And I thought this was fascinating being in Washington, D.C. This was a announcement that Rosa Parks was going to be coming to Baltimore and speaking. Um, and so she talks about that frequently as well. The fact that, you know, she's this very anonymous person. <laughs> and then all of a sudden overnight within the civil rights movement, she's really well known and being invited to come out to these different parts of the country and um, speak. So really kind of amazing transformation. She wasn't paid for any of these events. They pretty much just paid for her um, transportation expenses. And that's Thurgood Marshall, by the way, in the previous photo. Um, Martin Luther King, he's able to eventually, he's, I think Martin Luther King, if I'm not mistaken, was arrested 35 times, something like that. And um, this particular charge, the one where he was, I was showing the mugshot, he's eventually able to get out of those charges. This is a famous um, picture of him. So this is when he's living in Montgomery and he's involved in the bus boycott and that's his wife kissing him. And the reason they're so happy and people are celebrating in the background was because he beat um, the charges that were levied against him for his involvement in the bus boycott. Um, it's kind of a long legal story. You could probably spend quite a few minutes talking about all the legal ease of the uh, Montgomery bus boycott case, but suffice to say in a kind of a Cliff's Notes version, it goes through the Supreme Court process and eventually it was decided that the bus segregation in Montgomery was unconstitutional and thus illegal. And bus segregation is not allowed per the Supreme Court of the United States. And it took 381 days um, for this to happen. So over a year. So, um, you know, this, I kind of, I like to uh, draw 
uh, strength or inspiration from historical topics for kind of modern times. And so, hey, we've been dealing with this COVID thing for how long? Well, it hasn't been 381 days yet. And you know what? Those folks in Montgomery, they got through the bus boycott. And I think we can get through the COVID situation too. Now, after uh, the bus boycott ends, of course, the buses are somewhat integrated. Uh, it was also interesting in Rose's book, she talks about the fact that a lot of, not all, but there was a fair number of African Americans that even after the bus boycott ended, they did not feel comfortable sitting up at the front of the bus. Not that they couldn't legally, this that they were worried or concerned there were going to be some reprisals against them if they did so and kind of flaunted um, their ability. So she talked about that um, a little bit in her book, the fact that some people were still very weary about doing that. So it was almost like the segregation to a certain degree um, still continued. Now, this is the day after the bus. This is the day the buses first started integrating. Um, and it's Martin Luther King there. And pictures of that. Now, they got up early in the morning and the press, some members of the press were following them around to take basically pictures of the bus being integrated. Have you seen these? Um, so that's what those photos are. And then this is a photo that's also um, sometimes miscategorized. This is probably the most famous photo of Rosa Parks. And this one is also periodically miscategorized. People look at this and they know that Rosa Parks was arrested for sitting in the front of the bus. And it looks like here she's sitting in the front of the bus. So they think that, oh, this must be the picture of when she was arrested. No, <laughs> um, what this is, is after the Supreme Court ruling and the buses were integrated, the, there was a reporter basically asked if she would come um, from Look Magazine, basically sit on a bus and, you know, travel around and let them take her picture sitting in the front of the bus. And initially she declined because the day the bus segregation ended, Rosa was really sick. Um, and so she was, you know, I'm not interested. I'm not feeling well at all. I'm going to have to stay home today. And eventually, though, later in the day, she started to feel a little bit better and she kind of pulled herself together and went and sat on the bus um, and then they snapped a few pictures. Now what's funny from a photography standpoint is they took a few photos, like this is the probably the second most famous one of that day, but this is the one that the editor ran with. And so um, just think if the editor would have picked this one, maybe this would be the most famous photo of Rosa Parks, but this is the most famous photo and it's the most famous photo of Rosa Parks because the editor <laughs> of all the different photos that were taken said, oh, this is the one. But imagine if he would have said, this is the one. So this one is not nearly as well known, but it's on the same day. They just, she just basically switched seats. So just want to clear up a little bit of the um, misinformation, so to speak, on those photos. Um, now, if you're going to be watching the Rosa Parks movie, um, you can be on the lookout for uh, those photos because they do incorporate them in scenes in the film with Angela Bassett. And that'll be coming up at eight o'clock. So Martin Luther King, um, not many people outside of a small amount of religious and academic circles had heard of him before the Montgomery bus boycott, but because of his leadership in it, he starts to get some national notoriety. And so I believe this is on the left side. This is the first time he's ever on the cover of a news media magazine in the US and it's Jet and it's from early 1956. Uh, remember the bus boycott started in December of 55 and ran through December of 56, so very early on. And then later on, um, after it was resolved, the following year, he ends up on the cover of Time magazine. So quite an accomplishment for him. So again, that's one reason why Martin Luther King and Rosa Parks are so closely intertwined because this is where they first meet and get involved um, in their civil rights activities. And the Montgomery bus boycott really um, catapults King to a national level as far as civil, leadership, civil rights leadership goes. Now, the bus that Rosa got arrested on, whatever happened to it? Well, there's a picture of it right there on the left. And I know my friends from Detroit know where it's at because um, it's in a museum there. But let's talk about that. So the bus was lost for decades. It just kind of disappeared. Um, you know, it, the, the local authorities didn't want to keep it. It wasn't, it was a, a sign of defeat for them. And back in eras gone by, historical items weren't maybe as um, revered as they are today. And so the bus kind of got lost. And then people wanted to start to think, you know, whatever happened to that bus? Where is it? We should go find it. Maybe, maybe it's still around. And they end up tracking it down. And they hear a rumor that it might be at this farm. Um, and what happened was there was a guy that worked for the bus company. 
he just so happened to write down the number of the bus um, in a rec and in some paperwork. And so they went back and found those records like, oh, okay, it's, you know, bus number one, two, three, four, five or whatever. And then they heard that this bus on this farm might be the one. So then they went there and fortunately the bus still had the bus number etched on it. And so they were able to match that with the record and say, wow, this is actually the bus that Rosa Parks was on. Now it was in terrible shape. The guy was using it as like a shed. Uh, and so they had taken all the seats out. So this is basically when the the historian showed up um, to f f see if it was the real deal. So it was in pretty, pretty bad shape. This is the view from the other side. And here's the driver's seat. And then this is the inside. So again, the guy ripped out all the seats and was basically using it like a shed. I, he bought it like a scrap sale. Um, and just thought, you know what, this old bus would be cheaper than getting a, a new shed. So and plus it'd be pretty big. And so we just use this. So then he ends up putting it up um, for sale. And I've heard that the Smithsonian and the Henry Ford Museum, which is in Dearborn, Michigan, Dearborn is a suburb of Detroit. I heard they were the top two bidders and, but the Henry Ford Museum outbid the Smithsonian, which um, a friend who wishes to rename anonymous um, at the Smithsonian told me they're still upset about, but hey, <laughs> what can you do? Um, so anyway, it ends up at the Henry Ford Museum in Dearborn, Michigan and Dearborn is a suburb of Detroit and you can go check it out. So they hauled it back up to Michigan. They restored it um, and put it on display. And you can actually walk inside of it. A lot of these historical type things, you can't go inside of them, um, but this one you can. So it's pretty amazing to be able to actually, you know, touch it and go walk inside and sit down. And they have a lot of um, programs around it, like educational programs. So pretty amazing. So this is what happened to the bus. And President Obama came and paid it a visit. And so, um, if you, I wanted to show you this picture, not so much that he's in it, but because to get a sense of how small the bus was, um, you know, bus, like if you think about like in Washington, D.C., the Metro, those cars are like pretty big. Um, but, you know, these, this bus was actually pretty small. That was kind of my, one of my takeaways when I actually visited in person, like, gee, this was kind of cramped. You knew you could almost kind of visualize a bunch of people, um, you know, in here and kind of shuffling around the seats and whatnot. Um, the seat that on the left that has the white star in it, that's the seat where Rosa Parks would have been sitting. Again, the seats had to be um, replaced because they were torn out. And I noticed in this picture, President Obama is not sitting in Rosa Parks seat. So that's kind of interesting. But this was a photo that the um, White House released when President Obama was in office. And then I, I like to keep an eye out for just different historical things that are circulating. And I always like political cartoons because they kind of sum up situations. So this was um, the day that President Obama was elected. And it was talking about the fact that kind of comparing like, oh, you know, Rosa Parks and her impact in the civil rights movement um, may have helped lead to President Obama getting elected. And that's him in the uh, White House or the, um, the presidential limousine. Now, Montgomery after the bus boycott, what happened after the bus boycott? So if you're gonna be watching the film either tonight or in the future, uh, the Rosa Parks story, it's really, really well done. The problem, the couple things that I wanna mention about it is number one, the problem with it is it's a film and it only has so much time and any, almost all Rosa Parks type documentaries or stories or whatnot, they pretty much end with the Supreme Court deciding that the bus segregation is illegal. And then that's like the end of the movie and the credits start rolling and you think that, oh, okay, I guess everyone just kind of lived happily ever after. No, that's not what happened at all. So this is another kind of crazy part of the story. So let's talk about that. So these people that were very adamant about the fact that they did not want the bus um, segregation to change and they didn't want the Jim Crow laws to change and they firebombed Martin Luther King's church. Do you think once the Supreme Court decides that the bus um, segregation is illegal. They're just gonna be like, oh, okay, everything's fine now. We'll live all together and be happy. You think that's what happened? No, of course not. Um, so let's talk about some of those things. So this is the part of the Library Congress exhibit that deals with that. Now, this is 21 days after the buses were integrated and there's a big event and you can see the caption up at the top. It says, on this day in Alabama history, Montgomery churches ministers' homes were bombed. So there was a series of bombings of churches and ministers' homes just three weeks after the buses were integrated in retaliation um, against that decision. This is one of the homes. Now, fortunately, there was no one 
um, seriously hurt in this case, but again, it's this use of violence to intimidate people. This is a not a super well-known case. Um, this is one that's uh, it's a terrible case and it's unfortunate it's not more well-known. So this takes place 34 days after the buses were integrated. I want to include this just so you can kind of get a sense of what was going on um, down in Montgomery for people of color. This is January 23 or January 23rd, 1957, Klan forces man to jump from bridge. So what happened was this gentleman, Willie Edwards Jr., he was a truck driver for the Winn-Dixie department store or Winn-Dixie grocery store, sorry. And it was his day off. And he gets called into work or asked if he can come into work because one of the other drivers is out sick. And so his management calls him and says, hey, uh, Willie, I know it's your day off, but can you come into work and cover for this other guy who called in out sick? And he says, yeah, sure, no problem. And so that's what he does. And the Ku Klux Klan, though, had been targeting the guy who called in sick because he was in a relationship with a white woman. And so they stake out this guy's route because the, the guy that they were targeting, they knew the route that he took. And so they're staking out the route. Um, they see Willie drive by and they think that he's the other guy. Um, and so they confront him and basically kidnap him. And he's taken to a bridge um, and he's, he doesn't know what's going on, but the Klan thinks that he's this other guy. And they at gunpoint tell him that if he doesn't jump off the bridge, uh, they're gonna shoot and kill him. And so he obviously can't get shot and killed. So he takes his chance jumping off the bridge, but the bridge was extremely high off the water and he's killed once he hits the water. Um, and so then his body is not found for several weeks. And so that's what this headline is. It says um, on the left, truck found abandoned driver sought. Um, but again, this is 34 days after the buses were in Grand Montgomery, you have the Ku Klux Klan killing this guy um, for thinking that he was involved in a relationship with a white woman, which um, number one, he wasn't the guy, number one. Number two, who cares if someone's in that kind of relationship? Um, number three, you got the Klan going around terrorizing people. So again, I don't want you to think that like, oh, the buses were integrated and everything was fine after that, because that's actually not what happened at all. It was a big milestone and a big step forward, but it was there, the journey was um, still a long ways to go. In fact, some people would say still has a long way to go even today. And this gentleman's name was Jeremiah Reeves. This is Rosa Parks' brother. Oh, sorry, I forgot. This was a different case, sorry. Um, Jeremiah Reeves was another gentleman who was arrested and he was accused of having intimate relationships with a white woman. Um, and she accused, they, they thought it was rape and it wasn't, it was a consensual age, but he actually ended up getting executed. Um, for this, and this was, took this case took place in 1958. So again, the violence against African Americans down in Alabama. And Rosa Parks was very familiar with this case. She actually met him in, in jail and was corresponding with him and meeting with him, trying to keep his spirits up and working with the NAACP to try and get him out um, and released. But he was not. He was sentenced to death. Thus, the headline of this or the title subtitle this book: um, "Hold Back the Night." the legal lynching of Jeremiah Reeves Jr. He was found guilty in a court and sentenced to death. This is Rosa Parks' brother. He was in the army during World War II and he decides that the life after being in Europe and in the military, he decides that life in the segregated Jim Crow South is not for him. He moves up to Detroit and he encourages Rosa to join him. But initially she does not want to, um, but over time, with the um, threat of violence against her and her husband, she decides that, yeah, that might be a good idea. The, the parks were actually getting phone calls and death threats on a regular basis. So, I mean, imagine that you're Rosa Parks, um, you know, at some point in time, you're going to be this heroic figure, but they were really struggling in a lot of ways after the bus boycott started because again, both of them lost their jobs. Um, they're getting these phone calls at their house and death threats and all that stuff. And they're like, you know what, we better get out of here. Um, and so eventually they moved to Detroit at the Library of Congress. They have their, um, <laughs> their uh, moving van paperwork. I, one of Rosa's um, relatives paid for the moving expenses to transport their stuff from Alabama to Detroit. And then the tax document here, you can learn a lot about people um, by looking at their taxes. And so this 
was where they had the, the financial records of the parks to basically show the massive financial hit that they took when they lost their jobs and then had a hard time um, getting employment afterwards. So Rosa Parks, um, you, know, you might think, well, you know, she went through the bus boycott stuff and um, you know, nothing really happened to her. No, a lot of stuff happened to her. I mean, she got these death threats, it was financial strain, a huge amount of stress, et cetera, et cetera. She sometimes questioned whether she should have gotten involved in that. I mean, um, fortunately it has a happy ending, but there were times when it was very challenging. When she goes to Detroit, she starts volunteering for the congressional campaign of John Conyers, and he wins election as a congressman representing Detroit and he hires Rosa to work for him. Um, and so she finally gets a job from him um, and he ends up serving a long time in Congress. This is a picture of the two of them. They're doing a demonstration outside of a building in downtown Detroit. And in Rosa Parks, they've really adopted uh, her and they have a street named after her. And again, this is how I first learned about Rosa Parks um, on an extensive basis as I'm originally from Detroit myself. Although I never got to meet Rosa Parks, unfortunately. So another part of Rosa's story that's really fascinating is her involvement in civil rights stuff after the bus boycott. So you think, okay, well, she, you know, she got arrested and uh, they had the Supreme Court case. What happened after that? Well, a lot of stuff her, not just moving to Detroit. So let's just go through some of the many, many, many things that she was involved with afterwards. I mean, if, if she would have never been involved in the bus boycott and just did all the stuff later on in her life, that would really be impressive because she was involved in a lot of instrumental and interesting things. Uh, this is Martin Luther King. This is eight years after Rosa Parks was arrested. Remember the um, forming of the partnership, so to speak, in 1955. This is 1963, August at the Lincoln Memorial, Martin Luther King giving his famous I Have a Dream speech. And guess who was there that day? Rosa Parks. You can tell she's there. There's, you'll see quite a few photos of her um, from this day. She's all dressed up with her pearls and her gloves. But the way you can tell that she's at this particular event is if you look, there's a button um, on her that says March for Jobs and Freedom. Just kind of for contextual purposes, um, this is in 1965. So the film Selma takes place after the bus boycott, after Martin Luther King's speech in Washington. Um, and what's, <laughs> I should have brought an example, but what I find disappointing is I frequently see this photo being used in different contexts, but sometimes it's cropped and they chop off like the left side of it. And but look who's on the left side, Rosa Parks. She's marching right along with Martin Luther King. But I can't tell you how many times I've seen this photo and they've cropped it. So you just really see like Martin Luther King and like, you know, the couple people um, to his left, our right, and then vice versa. And they and they chop off Rosa Parks. I mean, what's up with that? She's there marching with Dr. King. So um, if you see this photo, you got to be on the lookout for it. If, they, if they did a good job, they'll keep her in it. If they, if they didn't do a good job, they crop her out of it. Um, here is Rosa with Stokey Carmichael. Here's Rosa with Malcolm X. I feel like uh, this is, you know, Malcolm X is still a controversial figure for some people uh, even today. And Rosa Parks was a big admirer of Malcolm X, which is interesting because she also really admired Martin Luther King. And sometimes those two had very conflicting uh, ideas or beliefs about stuff, but she really liked Malcolm X. And she talked about that um, in interviews and her book and whatnot. Um, I feel like this part of her story, some people that are maybe more, I don't know, would like to kind of not let you know that Rosa Parks <laughs> liked Malcolm X. Um, so she, you read her book, she says great things about him, but you don't really see that mentioned a lot in different historical contexts. They kind of like, well, yeah, he was kind of radical. We don't want to, um, you know, admit the fact that she liked him. Uh, and this is Rosa, and that's just my opinion, by the way. Uh, you may have a different opinion. Uh, this is Rosa Parks with Shirley Chisholm. Big support of her as well. This is Rosa Parks receiving an award from the Senate. That's Al Gore giving her the award. Beautiful smile on the left. This is Rosa Parks receiving the Presidential Medal of Freedom from Bill Clinton. There's a great... Um, we don't have time to look at tonight, but there's a lot of great YouTube videos about the ceremony um, of Rosa Parks um, receiving this recognition. So they're pretty cute. If you get a chance to check those out. 
And so they actually have the medal on display at the Library of Congress and the certificate that went through it. So most, a lot of these pictures that I'm showing you are actually stuff that's at the Library of Congress, not all of it, but a lot like the bus isn't there. Uh, <laughs> but um, a lot of these things are actually from the Library of Congress. And hey, how cool would it be to meet the Pope? Um, so Rosa Parks had that distinction as well. So again, just she led a really fascinating life after the bus boycott. It's not like, oh, okay, she, you know, she just went and did that and then you know, just became a hermit and was never heard from ever again. But again, I really feel like this is a part, there's so many facets of her life that aren't told. It's really, okay, Rosa Parks and she gets arrested and da da da. da. And you know, the rest of the other 99% of the story just kind of gets lost to the wayside, unfortunately. Rosa talks about how one of the most um, rewarding parts of her involvement in the civil rights movement was the letters and cards and whatnot that she received from children and the fact that they told her that she inspired them to do different things or get involved with stuff and she was really super proud uh, whenever she would get these letters and cards from children. Um, you know, thanking her and telling her that, you know, they love her and they admire her and when they get older, they want to be like her, et cetera, et cetera. So a really, um, really touching and they have some of those on display there. But all good things must come to an end and Rosa Parks passed away in 2005. This is a Detroit News article. So the reason, one of the reasons why uh, the bus that she was arrested on ended up in Detroit was because Rosa Parks was living in Detroit. And so she has this really strong connection there. And so because the museum is there, that's why they want it as opposed to like say the history museum in, I don't know, Chicago or something. So that was why they were bidding with the Smithsonian because Detroit really adopted uh, Rosa Parks. And again, she had to find refuge there after the threats of violence, her and her husband both fled um, over concerns for their safety. Here's another article of her passing. So she got a good deal of press coverage as you could expect back in 2005 when she passed away, mother of the civil rights movement. And there's a political cartoon with, a, so it's a political cartoons always do a good job kind of summarizing a situation. So here's one for that. And Rosa Parks lies in honor at the Capitol on her passing and has a statue of her in the Capitol, you can go see. And again, we talked about these three well-known photos um, and hopefully you learn a little bit more about the historical context of what happened at these photos and Rosa's life and how fascinating it was. And one thing that I find interesting being a person who talks a lot about history, I sometimes hear people say things like, well, you know, boy, I'd like to get involved and do something myself, but, you know, I don't have the education or, you know, I don't have the contacts or, you know, I don't have money or all that kind of stuff. And you know what? Look, Rosa Parks, she did all these things and she didn't have a great education. I mean, she graduated from high school, but she didn't go to college and she definitely was not rich and she didn't have a lot of connections uh, early on in her career. I mean, yeah, maybe later on she met Martin Luther King and the Pope, but I mean, she really had a huge impact on society and the world. And she came from very humble beginnings. So I always get disappointed or frustrated when I hear someone say, well, you know, I'd like to do something, but I can't because I don't have, you know, this or that. You have whatever it is <laughs> you need to do what you got to do. So it worked out for Rosa and it worked out for you. So that is Rosa Parks, the first lady of the civil rights movement, born in 1913. She died in 2005 and she was arrested in Montgomery, Alabama, 65 years ago today, uh, December 1st, 1955. And hopefully if you wanna learn more, you can come check out our film. We're gonna be streaming in 27 minutes. So that's at eight o'clock. So I'm not gonna be able to stick around for questions because I gotta get the film queued up. But if you wanna join us for that, the connection information is in the email that I sent that had the connection information for this. If you can't join us, don't worry. You can check the film out on your own. It's called the Rosa Parks story. So thanks for joining us. I'm going to let all of you go and hopefully I will see uh, most of you in 27 minutes. So thanks everyone for joining us. I will see you in a little bit. Take care.